is actually going to be what is called a partially constrained element. Because as you can see, this steel railroad reel is actually going to have some room to expand until finally it hits some constraint at some length away. So let's go ahead and read this problem. It says a 10 meter long steel railroad reel is laid out with a clearance of three millimeters at a temperature of 15 degrees Celsius. If the temperature of the reel raises to 40 degrees, 42 degrees Celsius, the stress induced within the reel will be most close to what? We're given some data here. Number one, we have a 10 meter long steel railroad reel. It's laid out. It has a clearance of three millimeters before it hits a solid rigid constraint. It's originally at 15 degrees Celsius and the temperature of this reel actually raises to 40 degrees, 42 degrees Celsius. So what is the stress that is induced within? Here's our slide once again, kind of telling you the difference between free versus constrained thermal expansion. And as you see in this problem statement, we're actually dealing with a hybrid of the two. It is free, but it is also constrained if it gets to a certain point. So because of that, we call this a partially constrained thermal expansion. We're actually going to use the same two-step process as we did for the constrained problem we just worked. Taking this back to our problem statement, you know, our first step is to determine the expansion that would occur as the object is free. If we determine that the expansion of this steel, uh, this steel railroad reel is less than three millimeters, then there's no need to move on to step two because there's not going to be any stress induced because it's actually not reaching that constraint. However, if we determine that the free expansion would actually be greater than that clearance of three millimeters, then there is actually going to be some stress induced in the reel. So let's go ahead and run through this process to kind of show you how it works. So starting with number one, you know the first thing we need to do is remove one of the constraints. So we do that by removing the wall at point B. Now we know that if it was free to expand that our steel railroad rod is going to expand some distance because we are increasing its temperature from 15 degrees Celsius up to 42 degrees Celsius. So here's our standard formula for thermal deformations and specifically free thermal deformation. We'll go ahead and pull this back over to our problem statement. I think we've done this process enough times to know that it's fairly streamlined, fairly simple. If we see a free thermal expansion problem on the exam, there's not going to be much effort that you're going to have to put into it because you know it's essentially a plug and play uh, plug and play problem of course depending on the direction they take it sometimes they might have you reverse engineer into determining what the coefficient of thermal expansion is uh, maybe what the uh, final temperature will be something like that but it will be a derivative of using this free thermal expansion formula so let's define what is given in our problem statement for our steel railroad reel. So first we know that the initial length is 10 meters. We know that the initial clearance or delta C is three millimeters. I'm gonna go ahead and convert that into meters. Keep everything nice and clean. So 0 0.003 meters. We know our initial temperature is 15 degrees Celsius. We know we raise it to 42 degrees Celsius. So there's our temperature gradient. We know that some expansion will occur. And we know from our free thermal expansion formula that we're gonna to need to determine what that thermal coefficient is or that the coefficient of thermal expansion is. So like we've done from the very get, we'll hop back to page 84 of our NCES reference handbook and Look at that top table, specifically the fifth row, find our, ro our fifth column, find our row that represents steel. So we're given two variables, which one is going to be used. Looks like everything is defined in degrees Celsius. 
So our coefficient of thermal expansion is actually going to be 11.7 times 10 to the negative six per degrees, per degree Celsius. Now, I keep stressing the importance of making sure that you have the correct units. This is a common error, especially under timed constraints on the FE exam. You'll go simply back, you'll pull that 6.5 over, and believe me, and trust me, even if you work this problem out to the end, you would find that the option that you get, though incorrect, is presented to you as a correct answer in the options that you're given. So be careful on which coefficient of thermal expansion you choose. So we have everything we need to determine what the free expansion is going to be. We simply just plug it in, chug it through our calculator and find that if free to do so, our steel railroad reel is going to want to expand 0 0.0032 meters. So we go ahead and plug that piece of data into our diagram. So this is our thermal expansion. Had the railroad reel been free to expand. And then of course, this is the clearance that we have before the railroad hits a constraint. So the question to you is, are we going to have stresses or is the railroad reel have enough clearance to expand given these circumstances? We will actually be experiencing stresses because under free expansion, our steel railroad reel is going to actually want to expand 3.2 millimeters. And because our clearance is three millimeters, there's actually going to be some stress induced in this railroad reel. So let's figure out how we're going to determine what that stress is. Again, we're going to place back our constraint at point B, which is going to push our deformation back and create a reaction force at the wall. So our illustration looks like that. Again, look at the blue dotted line. That's our free expansion, which is going to be prevented to some degree due to that constraint that is offset at a clearance of three millimeters. That little segment, however, is not 3.2 millimeters. That segment we're going to denote as Delta SC, essentially still constrained. That little constrained segment is actually going to be equal to our free expansion, whatever that Delta is minus our clearance because that steel railroad rod is going to be able to freely expand all the way up to three millimeters without any stress induced. All we need to know is what is that little segment or how much more does it want to expand past that point which will create the stress. So we plug in our information. We know that our free expansion is 0 0.0032 meters. We know our clearance is 0 0.003 meters, which gives us a delta SC or a delta that is constrained of 0 0.0002 meters. So ever most the slightest constraint. However, due to that, there will still be a stress induced. Let's figure out what that stress will be. So moving on to point two, we will determine this stress. We'll hop back to page 80 of our NCES reference handbook and specifically hone in on this nice little Hooke's Law formula presented to us. We'll pull it back over to our problem statement generally. And let's take a look at the variables that we're given. We're given length, we know delta, we know temperature. But if we look at Hooke's Law, it actually wants us to determine what the area, the cross-sectional area, as well as what the Young's modulus is. Now we can determine what the Young's modulus is simply by going back to our property tables. However, we don't know the area, it's not given. It's just not part of our problem. So we have a little issue here, but obviously in reality we don't. Let me show you why. If you hop back over to page 80, we see that there's another relationship of Hooke's Law, which is given to us here in this form. So let's pull that back over to our problem statement. This same formula, let's pull this back to our problem statement, see how we can use this. How can we use this? So looking at what we're given, we can, or looking at Hooke's law, we can determine the Young's modulus, E. We want the stress, sigma. We don't have the strain, but if we look at the companion formula, we do have the delta divided by L, which is the strain, if you recall back from our second episode during our Mechanics of Materials series. 
So the strain is the change in length divided by the original length. So all we have to do is marry those two formulas together and create our own formula. As you see right there, it's equivalent to what you saw in the reference handbook. However, like many are given in the reference handbook, there's more that we can actually create based on those same relationships. So this is actually going to be the formula in this case that we're going to use. So it looks like we have most all this information except for the Young's modulus. So let's go ahead and hop back to page 84. Again, referencing that top table, that first column. We know we're working with steel. So again, we're going to use 200 GPA. So gigapascals is going to be our Young's modulus, or our modulus of elasticity. So with that, all we simply have to do is plug and chug. We got our delta which is represented by only the constrained portion. Again, this will be a simple uh, mistake many will make on the exam by putting the full 0 .0, 0 0.0032, the 3.2 millimeters. But really, all that up until three millimeters is free to con freely, freely able to expand. It's only the final 0 0.0002, so we put that into our formula calculated it out to determine that our stress induced is going to be 4,000 pascals or simply 4 megapascal and that's the correct answer so looking at our answer options answer b 4 megapascals is actually going to be our correct answer